Good evening and welcome to the Federal Way School District Board of Education meeting for March 12th, 2013. This time we'll reconvene from our, our executive session with us in attendance, Director Barney, Director Wilson, Director Griffin, Director Moore, and I believe Director Peterson will be joining us shortly. At this time I would ask the audience to please rise as we are led in our Pledge of Allegiance by the Todd Beamer High School, JROTC. You may be seated. And as usual, I'd like to thank the Todd Beamer High School JROTC program and those young people that led in our pledge. It's uh, wonderful to start a meeting with uh, our best and brightest. The board, this time, Board members, you should have an agenda in front of you. Yeah, Mr. President, I move that the Board of Education approve the meeting agenda March 12th, uh, 2013 as submitted. Been moved, do we have a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded for the discussion on the board agenda for this evening. Hearing none, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. In your packets, you should also have a consent agenda. Mr. President, I move for the approval of the consent agenda. And a second. It's been moved and seconded for the discussion on the consent agenda. Hearing none, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion carries unanimously as well. Thank you, board members, for that. This time we'll have our student and staff recognition with the Honorable Mark Davidson. Thank you, sir. Good evening, President Moore, members of the board, Mr. New. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce, it gives me, in fact, very great pleasure to introduce Federal Way City Council Member, Deanie Duclos. Ms. Duclos. Yes, ma'am. It's all yours. Good evening, members of the board. Superintendent New. Uh, the City of Federal Way takes pride in providing direct assistance to area businesses and institutions to start and expand recycling programs. The annual Business Recycler of the Year Award recognizes exceptional efforts to increase recycling, reduce waste generation, and embrace sustainable practices. And that's a hard word to say. We are very pleased to announce this year's Leadership in Recycling Award recipient is Federal Way Public Schools. The students, staff, and administration at Federal Way Public Schools have embraced waste reduction, recycling, and composting options in many ways, and their efforts are paying off with environmental and financial savings. The district recycled over 40% of its overall waste in 2012. This reflects recycling nearly 100,000 pounds of material. All schools have active recycling programs in place, and 14 school cafeterias and counting now have food scraps recycling programs. 
Annual savings due to the recycling and food waste diversion programs are expected to exceed $50,000 per year. And can you imagine what the school can do with that to help educate our kids? The district also concentrates on using products made with recycled content to close the recycling loop, so to speak, and their recent construction project set a new standard for environmental performance especially the beautifully new maintenance and operation facilities facility that is expected to receive the accreditation from the leadership in energy and environmental design or more popularly known as LEADS. And I can tell you as coming from the housing industry, earning that accreditation is very difficult. So my hats are off to you. Today we recognize the school district's outstanding efforts with the Federal Way Leadership and Recycling Award. Now please have Superintendent Rob New and Board President Tony Moore come to the podium to receive, to receive the awards. I have one for each of you. I have this one, and Rob, I have this one. So. Thank you for serving as an example in the environmental excellence of the Federal Way community. You deserve this recognition for all the hard work you've done to boost recycling and your commitment to the environment. Thank you. Thank Can we you. get a picture with you? Too? Sure, if you want me. I don't right know. Front, yeah, please. Oh, okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jack Stanford from Rotary. Oh, excuse me. We'll, so we'll flip-flop the, the order. Thank you very much. Let's go next then to principal of Beamer High School, Mr. Randy Kazar. Randy. Superintendent New. Deputy Superintendent Davidson, distinguished board members, President Moore, fellow community members, I am Randy Kazar, campus principal, Todd Beamer High School. If I had a son, I would want them to grow up to be like Paul Kalebu, a current senior at Todd Beamer High School. Paul is an outstanding student, as you will see in a moment, but in addition to his brain, Paul has found a way to be a varsity athlete in both football and track. He is also secretary of Todd Beamer High School's Honor Society, as well as participating in the We Scare Food Hunger Drive this past fall. Paul will attend Wee Day, Seattle on March 27th. Paul also volunteers as a tutor after school at Todd Beamer High School's Titan Quest. This year, Paul has received a very prestigious scholarship that I really can't divulge at this time, but it'll be divulged on April the 10th. And he is also a finalist for the very competitive Gates Millennium Scholarship. Paul has been accepted to MIT in the fall of 2013. Paul is currently involved in the Northwest Nuclear Consortium he recently participated in Code Day in Seattle. It was featured on King 5 News with a team of fellow high school students as well as college students. They developed an app. He's going to share that in a minute. This past summer, Paul attended MITE's program at MIT. I asked Paul to come this evening to talk about his future plans as well as specifics on his nuclear fusion work, his experience at Code Day, and his work with the MITE's program. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul K. Lieber. Um, I'm Paul Kalebu, and <laughs> I want to be an electrical engineer and computer scientist, but my approach to this decision was not immediate, it was not instantaneous. It took a while to, uh, a lot of experience and a lot of exploring for me to discover what I actually want to do. And last year after football season, uh, I had no more Friday night lights to say, and um, my physics teacher, Mr. Glasser, introduced me to this guy who lives close to Decatur and he has a nuclear reactor in his basement and I was like, well, I want to try it out because that's pretty, it's not something you see every day. So I go there and he introduces me to the guy. This guy's like one of those 
cool people, but then he has that other side of a mad scientist you see on the TV shows, so. <laughs> but he's a pretty interesting guy, and he's really nice. And um, I decided to join his club, the Northwest Nuclear Consortium, and we formed a team for our school called the Firefly Team. Um, at the Northwest Nuclear Consortium, we basically carry out experiments with the reactor, not just to play with it, but to study nuclear engineering and understand how all the processes take place in there and how we could make a nuclear fusion a more viable source of energy. And after that, it's what I find really cool about it is his wife gives us cookies before we leave, so <laughs> it's just <really> interesting. <laughs> And uh, this last year, actually, we went to uh, Imagine Tomorrow, and we practiced our science, and our experiment did not really, our hypothesis did not prove to be true, but we still participated in the competition. And the lesson I learned from that was uh, integrity is really important. Not to, it's like really important not to lie, because we ended up winning the competition, and I thought that was pretty cool. So when the seniors left, I felt like I had the responsibility to uh, recruit new people to the club and I helped, uh, I guess, introduce them to the new information and the stuff we were learning. And now we have a new team and then we're going to Imagine Tomorrow again this year. And um, the guy we work with has developed courses for, for us to learn more about engineering, science, and mathematics. And I think it's a pretty cool thing going on. I'm pretty thankful for it. And um, it developed my curiosity and my interest in science. So one time I was just uh, looking around on the internet and I just landed on this program called MITES, uh, Minority Introduction to uh, Engineering and Science at MIT. And I thought that would be pretty cool to spend a summer at MIT. But I didn't really put much effort in it because I really didn't have high expectations of myself. I thought MIT was a really prestigious place I was not built for. So I, I talked to my dad and he told me um, not to deny myself the place, but let them deny me. So I should just apply and let, take the chance, you know? So I put my effort in the application and I apply. And I turned my application about a week early but they pushed the date for it. I'm like, oh, well, I could have worked it a little more. I guess those other kids have a better chance than I do. But then I forgot, I totally forgot about it. One time I remember I was just laying on my bed. The acceptance letter had come in on Tuesday of that week, but it was like Friday and my mom just got the mail and said something came in from MIT. I'm like, oh, interesting. So I opened it, I'm like, wow, I got into the program. It's pretty cool, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I buy a plane ticket and they pay for everything besides the flight there and back but everything was paid for what I thought was really cool is they gave us it was basically a debit card with $70 on it every week and we kind of the kids we, we developed a way to like budget our expenses and save and uh, buy like because it couldn't roll over to the next week so every Sunday kids would be buying more food to save for the next week and be able to save the money and buy like extra stuff, which I thought was pretty cool. But more to the program was, um, it's a six weeks, uh, six week program at MIT. It's really rigorous, but it's also fun. It's a really, um, ex it's a nice exposure, exposure to college in Boston, pretty much. And we took classes in physics, calculus, um, uh, biology, chemistry, biochemistry, humanities and uh, project courses. I took a project course in electronics. And the, pro the, uh, the program kind of, it taught me to, to work harder and taught me that in, in the future, outside high school, I'm not gonna be so successful on my own. Uh, an example is when we got the first problem set, I was pretty, I thought, I, I wanted to make a good impression. So I went to my room, I was like, I'm gonna, do this real quick, go to bed, and have it done by tomorrow, and just be really free, uh, unlike everybody else. So I get started on, it had six problems. I get started the first problem, 
and two hours later I'm still on the first problem and <laughs> I was pretty bummed so I just had to seek other uh, colleagues and just like work with them 20 minutes later we're on the third problem like wow that's really interesting so it gave me an appreciation for teamwork and um, one other thing I learned from it was uh, time management so they try to pressure you to do every activity they want you to do and you have to do it so it's engineered to make you to build you socially mentally and uh, academically and I made a lot of friends made a lot of connections and I'm still friends with all of them today and we have a lot of strong bonds but we all learn how to uh, be mature individuals and balance our time well and um, I gained an immunity to sleep deprivation. <laughs> so I remember one time I was working on a project and we had to present it. After my presentation, I was sitting in the stands. I, most of us just passed out, was sleeping and they took pictures, it was pretty embarrassing. But <laughs> it kind of taught me to budget my time a lot more and I thought that was pretty cool about the program. It was a pretty fun program and it gave me a sense of direction in what I want to do and uh, earlier the, in fall I wanted to be an electrical engineer, just an electrical engineer. But um, then in January my cousin told me about this thing called Code Day, which is uh, on the screens. And he told me it's a basically an event where kids get together, high school kids and college kids, mostly from UW, they get together and basically program for 24 hours. And I told him, I don't know how to program. I, there's no way I'm doing that. It's not happening. And so he's like, you don't have to know how to program. So I'm like, uh, should I do it? And then I thought about really exploring uh, opportunity given to me. So I decided to do it and just went to it. The first like 20 minutes were pretty awkward for me because everybody was sitting there just writing some program on their computers and I was just looking around trying to figure out what I should do but um, after we broke up into teams we got together with a couple of other kids who had no team but they knew how to program they're taking computer science at UW so we just started brainstorming what uh, project we're gonna do in the course of 24 hours and uh, we didn't really know what we were gonna do but one of them had an idea of doing uh, a Twichter scale to predict our, our earthquakes, but he didn't really know how to complete the whole program. So we we kept on brainstorming and working together, just um, filtering our filtering our ideas and uh, picking out the good ones and taking out the bad ones. And later we came uh, to this decision of comparing tweets and seeing which ones are more popular and. Uh, graphing them to show people which tweets are more popular, which Twitter, which Twitter topics are more popular. Uh, the main application for it was, for example, presidential elections. You'd see uh, the public attitude towards uh, the different candidates, and I thought of. I like when I was 13 I played a game where it was like Obama versus Clinton, and they were like pretty much fighting, and I thought that was pretty funny. So I was like, how about we have the different uh, Twitter topics be embodied in personalities that fight against each other and then the one that's more popular ends up winning and so we ended up calling it Twi Tweet Fighter named S sounds kind of like Street Fighter the <laughs> video game and um, it was basically uh, centered on an API that extracts tweets from Twitter and compares which, which topic has more tweets and later uh, represents them graphically to fight against each other and then you come out with a winner and I'm gonna sh I don't really have the exact program right now because the kids who wrote it they're studying for their midterms right now and they can't really uh, be distracted so I just uh, gathered because I did most of the design part design portion of it so I just uh, put together most of the stuff I did and put in a PowerPoint to kind of show how it would look like, and uh, not really sure if this is right. Huh? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Okay. There we go. And uh, so that's our logo. And then we got two characters. 
so there were two code days on the same day. There was one in Seattle and one in San Francisco. And one of my teammates suggested to do uh, to represent Seattle as a hipster because apparently Seattle is known to be stereotypically hipster attitude, I guess. And so, and then the other told me to draw like a hippie for San Francisco because that's where the movement was pretty much located. So I was like, oh yeah, sure, that sounds like a good plan. So those are the characters. And uh, it starts out by them coming against each other. They're gonna fight. You see the Seattle one has like coffee because it's Starbucks. And <laughs> uh, so round one, they're gonna fight. So basically what happens is as the tweets come in, the one that has more uh, it's basically sends a punch and as they keep coming in it could be countered by if, if one of them gets a higher uh, I guess number of tweets counters with another punch and then later there's a kick to knock out the loser but it counts with I think it was 10,000 tweets so it keeps on counting counting until we have a winner so I'm just going to show you a simulated fight with PowerPoint here so that's round one fight. So uh, the San Francisco guy attacks and he hits him and then keeps on hitting him. But then the Seattle guy has more tweets, I guess, and so counters it and then, I guess, knocks him out. <laughs> and so that was down and he loses. So we know Seattle uh, uh, touring, uh, topic one and it was. It looked a lot uh, more website-ish, but I didn't really have the program, so I couldn't really put it up. But that's pretty much what it looked like, and we're currently working on making it look better with um, more like sound effects and a lot of other stuff that can make it more applicable and more, uh, I guess, uh, enticing to use it to people who could come in and like pay money to use it, and. Um, we happened to win the contest, which I was pretty happy about, and that's us with our first place tro trophy. And what I learned from this was, if you don't really try, you don't find out what you could do. And the fact that I won without any knowledge of programming really, I don't know, <laughs> dazzled me somehow. And <laughs> right now I'm taking classes to be able to uh, work on more projects and uh, accomplish a lot more in what I want to do and now I this kind of uh, added ki I didn't want to leave electrical engineering so I just now I want to be electrical engineer and a computer scientist basically. And finally this evening, I'd like to introduce Ms. Fran Oishi, who has some work to do. Thank you. Longtime esteemed colleague. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Good evening. My name is Francine Oishi, and one of my duties in Federal Way is the pleasurable responsibility of working with National Board for Professional Teaching Standards facilitators who are in the back of the room right now who really do all of the work. So good evening, President Moore, Superintendent New, and members of the board. It is a joyous occasion tonight because I get to introduce some fabulous people who join an elite group of teachers who achieved National Board certification. I'm going to call the names of everyone because I think they need to be recognized for their hard work. But I will assure you, if they are not here tonight, I'm, I'm certain it's because they're working on lesson plans, studying, or doing whatever it takes 
to get students to grow and learn and thrive and prosper. Um, but as I call the names of those people who are here, because I do see some of them, I'd like you please to step forward to the front of the room so that I can talk about you um, after we're all up here. We have Dia Bailey, Brianne Ball, Sherry Blair, Elise Bruce, Raza Conklin, Rebecca Crawford, Ed Curson, Amy Davis, Amy Dubois, Vicki Drury, Chelsea Gallagher, Eric Grotsky, Cassie Halliden, Amy Heritage McDonald, Cindy Hubbard, Jen Mark, Angela Matson, Jennifer Adrian McKay, Trisha Ramos, Paul Rustin, Charlene Sewell, Sarah Stevens, Malia Sturgeon, Mike Tarling, Pam Taylor, Kay Walls, Liz Willard, Heather Wren, Stephanie Wright. I'm going to give everybody a chance to get their trophies before I make some comments. So if you could form a line so everyone can see you as I describe the process that you went through. Yeah. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, you might have noticed the names took a very long time. There were 30 names that I called. In 2012, we added 30 more National Board Certified Teachers to the ranks of our teaching staff in Federal Way. We now total 174 within the ranks of our teachers, which is actually 14% of our teachers in Federal Way that are nationally board certified. I think you will not be surprised to know that those teachers that have undergone this rigorous process are better for it, which results in better education for our students. You know, lately there's been a lot of buzz in the news about Gonzaga hitting that national poll, but Federal Way hit the national poll as well, because this past year we were number 12 in the entire nation for the number of new nationally board certified teachers in the nation. I'm not really competitive, but we were behind Bellevue. But, but we can change that. <laughs> you heard the young man a moment ago talk about sleep deprivation. And I'm going to tell you these people understand that because I'm going to suspect this is what it's like. Imagine having a full-time job. And you know, teaching is hard work. We go through tons of decisions. We do best by our students. But then they leave work, which probably is not you know, right after the allotted time. They're going home. They're probably having something to eat. I'm hoping they did. And then they go right to the books to prepare for National Board por Portfolio Submission, preparing for Assessment Center, and you know, weekends, more of the same. It's estimated that these teachers have spent over 200 hours preparing for this test. And to tell you how rigorous and how elite this group is, only 40% certify on their first attempt. It's, it's not easy. And I know 
with those of you guys looking over at your facilitators, you know that these fine people, and I would like to introduce Diane McSweeney, give away, and Jolinda Hernandez, as well as two of our facilitators who are not here this evening, Diana Thomas and Sue Ann Booby, guided these folks through the process. So I'd like to commend the, the district, the school board, and all of the people that helped to make this process possible in our district because it's the hard work that they do, but it's also your support, the family support, that makes it the way it has come out. So congratulations to all of you and an, an exemplary accomplishment. We know how rigorous the process was. Congratulations to our teachers. We at this time will continue on with our meeting. This time uh, we have a legislative update from Director Barney. All right. Um, we'll kind of give them a second there as they exit. I'll grab my papers right here. I uh, had an opportunity to attend the... Uh, Legislative uh, Assembly uh, this past weekend with uh, Superintendent New. Uh, it was quite interesting to hear some of the discussion that was going on during um, a couple of parts of the meeting. And I, have to my notes. <laughs> I took all kinds of notes and now I can't find them. Um, but they were talking, probably the biggest thing that they were talking about was uh, funding for uh, education. And I've heard, we heard numbers kicked around everywhere from uh, about a half a million dollars, 500,000 to 1.7 billion dollars. So what's actually going to come out of it, we're not sure, but uh, they are pushing uh, for at least a billion dollars this year, new monies into education. So that'll be the interesting thing to watch. Uh, it's suspected that the... Uh, Senate majority will put out a budget possibly this week as early as this week that was uh, discussed so we're hoping as ah, here we go I find my notes <coughs> that that could be you know like I say as early as this week Thursday they had mentioned uh, most uh, we happen to have uh, an opportunity to hear uh, Governor Inslee and he's talking about uh, closing corporate business loopholes in order to fund education. He wants to make sure that we fund education uh, not at the expense of the safety net, uh, which includes a lot of other things, uh, including uh, uh, health and uh, other programs for, for the homeless and uh, the elderly. Um, uh, Senator uh, Danmere was there, uh, Senator Billing, uh, Representative Wilcox and Hunter, uh, they were all there talking about some of the uh, issues with the ample funding. Uh, using, interesting comment was uh, using levy monies to fund basic education. They stated is the wrong thing to do, which we have known for, oh, how many years, Sally? <laughs> I think about as long as I've been on the board, and you've probably even known this uh, even longer. Uh, but some of the new monies that they will be adding to education are probably going to have a lot of strings attached. Funding will equal outcomes. I'm not sure how they're going to be able to fund it and see that the money gets to schools, but we have to prove that we earned the money or the students earned the money, which is going to be an interesting way to figure that one out. But 
We know that the two-thirds majority uh, for approval of tax increases or new taxes it was ruled unconstitutional. So they did talk about new revenues, new taxes, uh, potentially being on the table. Uh, it was interesting to uh, hear Representative Wilcox when he's talked about funding education first and then funding the rest of the state's priorities. So uh, <clears throat> in looking at some of the bills, uh, WASDA, I ha attended the, the legislative part early in the morning, and they weren't too interested in uh, supporting any bills unless they were permissive, meaning that they would allow the districts to opt in or opt out, do what they wanted to, such as our academic acceleration bill. They chose not to support it uh, because it required all districts to be into the program. Uh, the ones that they did, uh, they were continuing to uh, move on, was the uh, House Bill 1423, which is the alternative learning experience which requires monthly progress reports, uh, but then it also stops uh, OSPI from setting minimal seat time. Um, and they also, the other uh, academic learning uh, was Senate Bill 5794, which redefines and labels the hybrid remote classes, uh, allowing a lot of other things to be uh, used, such as uh, online education, uh, remote students, uh, so they're, they're not there, they don't have to have a certain amount of time in the class. They were talking about being 20% uh, time in class, but, so they're, we're supporting that one. And uh, the uh, Senate Bill 5587, which would phase out the use of the 10th grade state assessments or year-end course exams and replace them with the, uh, the core program, which is coming in. Those are the ones, and they were also talking about, and I don't know if they finally did approve it, but uh, about supporting the, uh, the districts keeping a supply of EpiPens within the district. Other than that, those are the only ones that WASDA endorsed as a legislative body. So that was kind of interesting to hear some of that. Uh, if it ca had money involved with it, they said, no, unless the money's there, we're not going to uh, support it. They did ask that... Um, those that were going to speak to uh, senators and representatives uh, on Monday, that they push the fu full funding of the uh, McCleary decision. And if they were to try to get that done by 2018, we are looking at probably a minimum of $1.7 billion for the next uh, several years. So we'll see how that goes. I'm not sure if they'll get to that point, but <laughs> it was interesting to hear that. Did you have anything else, uh, Superintendent, new that – you wanted to add? Just briefly that the, um, I think was a point to emphasize is that the McCleary decision that uh, requires from the Supreme Court to the legislature that they uh, fulfill the, the constitution of the state and amply fund education it needs to be done on a graduated basis. They can't wait to 2018 and make us whole. They have to show um, progress. And uh, the Supreme Court has already spoken to the legislature uh, after their first initial report saying, you are not making progress. And so it'll be really interesting to see how, how it uh, uh, proceeds from here. Yeah, because they showed the, the timeline when the M McCleary first came out that they actually dropped funding for two years, finally brought it back up to where they were at the beginning. So now they, they haven't gone anywhere. So now they have to bring it all the way up in the next uh, four years. Be interesting so, Ed, were you saying that um, on our academic acceleration, on the academic acceleration bill, that was a bill not supported by WASDA? That is correct. Oh, okay. Because it required all districts to participate. They want it permissive. To opt in and opt in. Yes, where the district could choose to be a part of that program. At some point, I, I would love for this board to have a public conversation about uh, sending WASDA a letter allowing us to opt out of their <laughs> of their organization annual payment and put those monies into our classroom so that uh, our kids will benefit versus their um, their political agenda we will have that conversation in the near future I just wanted to mention there were a couple of bills that folks had asked if I kind of follow up on uh, they really haven't updated the uh, Olympia's site except for House Bill 1723, the early learning. You'll be happy to know that there is a public hearing scheduled on the 15th 
So I know that one is there. STEM, I couldn't find anything on. And of course, the academic acceleration, I haven't seen any updates on that one either. So do you have any on that? Yeah, academic acceleration went through the Senate at a 47 to 0. Uh, 47 to 0? Yes, so okay, it passed cool. through the Senate. Don't know where it's at uh, at this time with the House. Yeah, I haven't seen any updates. And the House from the, the onset has, has been a little bit more difficult in terms of their interpretation of it. There was an amendment put forth by uh, Representative Maxwell that made it optional for districts. And uh, I've had the opportunity to talk to a couple of uh, representatives to say that that optional uh, amendment w is, is not an option. <laughs> the option is not an option. Yeah. Okay. As well as the organization that we pay annually to come out against us as well is not an option. <laughs> and that's all I have. Thank you, sir. At this time, we'll have public comment, and we'll start this evening with... Uh, a former board member, Mr. Charlie Hunt. Well, let me just comment a little bit on what Ed was saying. Uh, there's a famous quote around here that pretty well supported in this state, I thought, from the President of the United States, no amount of money will buy achievement. So. Now, the other piece of legislation which Ed did not talk about, but which the Senate passed uh, by a small majority, was grading of actual schools by the State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be well to share with you what those grades would look like, because I spent this afternoon working on that, and see if any of you would like this for a report card for your particular situation. So let's take a look first at the high schools. As you can see, we have three that are D pluses and one C and one C minus. Uh, let's take a look next at the middle schools, where we have a A, a couple C's, more C's than D's, two D's. And then the elementary schools, which take more than one page, but uh, I'll summarize those for you here. Uh, there are two B's, 14 C's, five D's and two F's. Uh, if any of uh, <coughs> you as parents would get your child's report card that would look like that, you'd probably be a little disturbed about that. Uh, <coughs> now the question comes is, who's responsible for this? And to some extent, I think we're looking in the wrong place. Uh, recently, a Danish study came out that said parental influence on test results was five times that of teachers. Now, I assume the water in Denmark is not much different than here. I've been to Denmark, tasted it. I don't remember it being different. So we need, I think, to do a great deal more about engaging parents in this problem, as these grades are basically derived from test results. That's going to require engaging parents. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Roth, did you cite where those two, that information came from, the first set of information? And what's this Danish study? Can you share that with that yeah, information? Yeah, I'd be is? happy to send that to you. No. So you don't have it now? You don't I don't know. have the okay. exact. Thank you. I have that, but I don't have it right here at the moment. But I do have the exact website for that, yes. At this time, we'll hear from Mark Knapp. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, board members, Superintendent New, and uh, members of the public. The Fort Worth uh, Police and Schools announced last week that they will train and deputize unarmed citizens to patrol the Fort Worth schools. This is actually something that's happening all over the country. Districts and states are all over the United States are providing additional armed and unarmed security in the schools. Uh, South Dakota is another state that just adopted some legislation which uh, has to do with uh, arming teachers, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, last month, I addressed the board and I told all of you that I would come back with some uh, recommendations from a committee which we formed at the safest uh, schools committee 
And uh, we met and we're requesting that the uh, board and the school district get involved with fostering unarmed citizen patrols. That's the consensus of this group is that uh, the, we, we want to work with uh, parental groups, the PTA and, and other groups. I've tried to contact the watchdogs and, and uh, the PTSA, but I'm convinced they're, they're not going to work with us unless they get some leadership from the, uh, from the district. To be honest with you, I haven't even gotten any response at all so far, even though I had a, a, a letter to the editor in the Federal Mirror. Um, our committee wants to work with these groups, parental, any parent groups in Federal Way School District. They're involved with the schools, and what we want to do is uh, recruit and empower volunteers. We don't claim to have any great expertise. We're just a small group. All we want to do is stimulate and encourage. And we can't empower uh, any kind of citizen patrols because that's something that the district would, would have to do. I don't think any parents are going to come forward unless the district somehow empowers volunteers. So the way that the district could do that is to put some programs in place, including uh, training programs for some unarmed volunteers to come into the schools. And, and I think that if the district encourages that, that you're going to find a lot, of, uh, a lot of parents and grandparents and others will want to get involved. In order to save lives, we're endeavoring to reach out and, and uh, do whatever it takes to get some kind of measures in place that will supplement the existing school security, which, which is good. We're not saying that the existing measures aren't good, but there's more that can occur that would be cost effective and feasible, and this is one way to do it. Thank you. This time we'll hear from Kurt Papard. Well, I'm happy to hear that the uh, armed volunteer stuff has kind of fallen off the table, Mr. Knapp. I was uh, reading Huffington Post here last week. No, it was the week before. Uh, it was actually a armed security guard. Gun went off in a hallway. Back a couple weeks before that, a retired sheriff in Ohio, in a school, left his gun unattended in the restroom. So too many accidents with guns, period, end of story. Um, so I'm glad that's off the table. Um, while I could support Mr. Knapp and wanting to get more volunteers in the school, I think I've mentioned this before, um, I'll also point out Mr. Knapp is extremely difficult at times. You know, I have about two or three people I can count on in the Watchdogs program to come in several times a year. To get the rest of them to come in more than once a year, very, very difficult. That's a good idea. I like it. But again, when we uh, get the volunteers, it's not, to me, not just getting them in there to be patrols, right? Because these kids need a lot more help. They really do. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Next up this evening, our superintendent. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, uh, directors. Just a, a couple of, of quick reminders. Um, we, we will not be having a board meeting on the 26th. Um, so I know that that's already been posted, um, but wanted to make sure that, uh, that that was a reminder that for, for the board tonight as well as the, the community. And of course, um, the reason that we're doing that is because of our participation and commitment to We Day Seattle, which is uh, coming on March 27th. So the next time we get together on April 9th, we will have a report out on the, our participation on We Day Seattle. And I think it's important to note that we are sending approximately 1,200 students to this event. And including adults that will be participating, uh, Federal Way will, will have approximately 1,400 people in attendance at We Day Seattle. And as we know, uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev will be uh, one of the speakers. We don't know the rest of the lineup, um, but, but we are assured that it's going to be a, a fabulous event in which our students and the adults that will be able to uh, attend, um, if not have a life-changing experience, certainly a life-impacting experience. So really proud to be partners with Free the Children and this inaugural We Day event in not only Seattle, but the first of its kind in the country. Um, I also would like to announce to the board that we were accepted. The Federal Way Public School, uh, School District has been accepted to be a participant in the Minority Student Achievement Network. 
The Minority Student Achievement Network has been in operation or in existence since 1999. They're headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, and there's only 25 school districts in the country that make up this consortium of schools whose sole purpose is to um, identify best practices and action toward closing the achievement and opportunity gaps for underrepresented, underserved students, students of color, uh, minority students, students of, of poverty. And uh, so it's quite an honor that we were invited to uh, apply. And it's even bigger honor that we have been accepted to be one of these 25 school districts from throughout the country that will be working together in research steeped best practices. Um, just wanted to uh, take a moment and uh, congratulate our National Board Certified Teachers. Uh, if people don't know, and I know Fran did a nice job of talking about it, it's a huge commitment and, and quite a tribute uh, to those folks, that, that uh, the 30 that were presented tonight um, and the numbers that, that Fran has shared. Um, we were second in the state, as she said, and uh, last year we were first in the state. So, and I also want to note that we, uh, we, we had more uh, National Board Certified Teachers this year than Seattle, which is, of course, the biggest school district in the, in the state. Um, you have in your consent agenda tonight EL6, which is on staff compensation. That is just receipt only, and we'll be ask, uh, asking you to uh, uh, take a, an action on that at the April 9th board meeting. And um, wanted to uh, take a moment while we were presented, uh, Director Moore and I were presented with the, uh, on behalf of the school district, with the recycling award from the, uh, the, the city. Um, the, the reality is, is that that is a, a student-led, staff-led initiative in all the buildings as was identified. Um, but in particular, I want to cite the work of uh, Danny Smith and Darcy Borg from Camelot who have really um, taken the lead in our recycling initiatives and efforts. They have formed a green coalition and I think it was their work that has kind of uh, spread and, 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 and uh, uh, created the energy in the other, pun intended I guess, the, the, uh, the energy in the other schools um, moving forward. And I know that when I was at, visiting at Sequoia a couple of weeks ago, that uh, it was there at lunchtime and they were showing me how they were recycling at lunchtime and um, indicated that they used to have uh, daily trash pickups that now are coming about once every two weeks. That's significant. Yes. So I'm really proud. Uh, it, it was proud to receive that on behalf of the district, but but the the credit goes to the to the students and the staff who are doing all the work out there and creating the ideas and opportunities. Lastly, I just wanted to uh, take a moment and um, congratulate all of our classified employees. It is Classified Employee Week, and uh, really take a moment to say that that the the, the support folks out there from our bus driver, and I know I'll, for, I'll forget groups, so I just want to go on uh, record right away as saying I'm not going to mention all groups, but you know the bus drivers who are the first to see and last to see the students at, at pick up and drop off every day, uh, the custodians who are weaving in and out of the building and establishing relationship with, with students, and of course the secretarial staff that are, that are there to, to work with the parents and, and provide support to the students, as you know, all these folks that we have out in, in our buildings doing great work every day without any recognition and, and, and really contributing to, the, to the, our students' um, success, their safety, their well-being, and providing support uh, to our teachers so that we can meet the needs of our students. I just want to say to all of our class, classified employees, thank you for all that you do, and, and a happy Classified Employee Week. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have board comments. I'll start to my right with uh, Director Griffin. So I'll also say congratulations or thank you to all of our classified employees for the great work that you do in our school district. Um, I'd like to, to respond to um, Mr. Knapp and sharing a little bit more about what the Fort Worth School District is actually doing with, parent, with volunteers. Um, they have resource officers in their middle schools and high schools similar to what our school district has. Um, but then they are also partnering with their police department who has over 900 volunteers that have been a part of a group called Code Blue for over 21 years who have put in 9,300 hours volunteering in that community. And um, so that what they're doing is they're actually partnering with these volunteers to do more strategic work around the perimeter of their elementary schools and eventually over time see how they can train those volunteers to possibly um, be more responsive to the school needs. So they are not arming volunteers to go into 
their schools. And so I just wanted to make sure that the public knows the, the truth about what that um, experience is like in Fort Worth. And as dialogue continues in our school district about arming volunteers, that we are um, very clear about what it looks like in other communities and, and how that might or might not work in our community. That's it. Thank you, Director Griffin. Director Wilson. Um, a couple of things. One is I want to shout out to Lake Grove Elementary Safety Patrol. If anybody watches the news in the morning, they were just recently on Tracy's Traffic Buddies for being a great uh, school patrol. And I think it's worthy of saying that they also help our kids get to and from school every day safely. And so I wanted to make sure publicly that they knew that I saw that. Um, the other thing I want to do is shout out to the district and specifically to Carol Matsui and Chris O'Dell and the staff, the students, and the families that are at Brigadoon Elementary. We recently had a situation in the district where there was a group of um, young children who were in a situation in a site that was no longer um, able to meet their needs. There was construction happening and they were without water and without a toilet and in less than a day the Federal Way School District decided that these young children were children that belonged to them and were concerned about their well-being and found a wonderful space at Brigadoon Elementary um, to house that program to the end of the year. And um, the, the way in which the school um, welcomed that staff in very short order and the support that was given by all um, is to be recommended. And I know that the Seattle King County Y thanks um, the district for their um, partnership and their support. Um, and I also um, want to say tomorrow, I appreciate um, Director Barney talking about House Bill 1723 and remembering early learning as a critical strategy as we think about the gap and the opportunity gap in school readiness for children. And that tomorrow is early learning advocacy day down in Olympia where we'll have probably 500 parents from across the state coming to talk to legislators about the importance of um, caring for kids prior to them entering school and um, telling them stories uh, about their world and their lives and the difference that support has made in not only their own success but their children's success. And I believe that that is parental engagement. And as we talk about the importance of families and the role that families play in student success and academic success, it's critically important. And as we think about that, um, I would rather think about engaging families in that way than engaging families um, related to citizen patrols. And as we think about adults in our buildings, um, I'd like to think about that as a way to support um, what's happening in schools. And we have wonderful programs like watchdogs. We have service clubs that have um, adults from the community involved. We have PTAs, we have PTOs, we have uh, key communicators, we have advocacy 101 workshops, we have what every parent wants to know. We have incredible opportunities in our district to engage families and we need to continue to do that so that they see they have a place in the school. So I really um, appreciate the use of citizens and the use of volunteers but in a very different way I think than Mr. Knapp you're speaking of. Um, and then the only other thing I guess I want to say is um, the idea about incentive, incentivizing outcomes is that for many, many years legislatively we've continued to put money in places um, just because we've always put money there. And so as we think about um, legislatively what we're looking at and where we're putting dollars, it is true what we're hearing from um, our legislators and our representatives is that you show me that where the money goes is going to make a difference and I will continue to give you money. But I will no longer and we can no longer continue to put dollars into programs and into initiatives and into services that are not um, providing the outcomes we're looking at for um, the children that we serve. And for that I think it is a different way of looking at things but I think it is the way that we do need to look because um, we have a limited amount of resources and we need to think about how we use those best to leverage outcomes for all kids. Director Barney. All right. Um, of course, my biggest uh, thing coming up is uh, Saturday. 
For those of you that are interested in elementary track, the first meet is on Saturday uh, at the stadium. So if you guys are available, come on down. <laughs> I'll be there about 7 o'clock setting up. Rain, hail, sleet, or snow, we'll be there. So we do encourage uh, the parents and families to get involved and help us in, in that program. It's the only way we keep it going. Uh, I would also like to uh, acknowledge all of our nationally board certified uh, teachers and congratulate them on their hard work as well as our uh, classified employees. Uh, on the grading of the schools, uh, it was interesting because I did have some information here on that Senate Bill 5328 that assigns letter grades. Uh, in high school, it's not just graduation, but it's a percentage of students that are involved in dual credit courses, post-secondary uh, readiness, as determined by the SAT or ACT uh, scores, uh, graduation by at-risk students and how they place. And the um, State Board of Education wants to give additional weight to reading um, uh, scores. So there's some other things that do play uh, into that, not just the uh, number of students passing tests. Uh, I also acknowledge uh, Lake Grove since that's in my backyard. I run past there quite regularly when the kids are out uh, helping the students cross, and it's really nice to, to see those kids actively involved in helping not only the, the other students but also the parents that are bringing their kids down. It's nice mm -hmm. to see that uh, working well. Great. Thank you. Director Peterson. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I was looking for a classified employees card today, and I could not find one at, at Hallmark. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like I said earlier, the, we are appreciative of our staff here in the district. And uh, I'm excited tonight. Uh, I know we're budgeting. We're kicking that off. And, you know, with what's go been going on in Olympia and, and that we're kind of in the spot of what, where, where are we uh, aiming and where do we want to put funds. And uh, I'm excited for the conversations we're going to have as a board and uh, looking forward to um, what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, Mr. Hoff, I think it's already been said with a couple people. I'll just touch on that. Uh, it's, I know we've asked a few times when you do come present to site where you're getting a lot of that information. For me tonight, when I saw those, those grades, you could have said red, yellow, green, blue uh, for that kind of stuff, just because unless we have those kinds of things cited and the context for it, to put up letters doesn't really help the conversation or anything. So if you could do that, that would be helpful. Uh, Mr. Papard, I just want to thank you for your, your service in our district with the watchdogs and other things, and we appreciate with what you're doing and uh, your perspective and, and uh, how you're looking for ways to help out our students. So thank you so much for being here tonight. That's all I have to say. Achievement Index State Board of Education. We're working on a comprehensive plan that is, is, is really deep. But to be clear, we will not have volunteers with guns in our school. Um, but the idea of volunteers and partnering and working with volunteers in our schools, uh, I think that's something that we can explore. And I think it's, it's wise for us to fortify our, our security, which we, which we are doing. So um, the ball is in motion with that. As far as the legislature and grading schools, um, Send us, I, one of my mentors in education said, just please send us some money first. Um, people talk about throwing money at education. Just try that one time and see what, see what we'll do. We have been innovative in our approach in, in this regard. We look at problems and try not to ignore them, but to take them head on, the difficult things that no one else will touch. I can understand why WASDA would not support academic acceleration, because it is not for cowards. And this district has taken some bold steps to guarantee every child gets an opportunity. And you can't say that in every district around this state. So I can understand why it's not supported. Mm -hmm. um, in 1954 and 55, when um, the court case, Brown versus the Board of Education, was in full bloom, um, it was very courageous for them to take those steps forward to guarantee every child an opportunity. That legislation passed, 
that law, that uh, court case was won, and of course those students entered into those schools, and they, um, they broke ground. What most people don't know is that after that, there were seven cases after that, because the schools refused to, once those kids were in the classroom, they refused to teach them. I, I think we're still arguing a lot of those same principles. And here in Federal Way, we've decided that not only are we going to give you an opportunity, we're going, to, we're going to support you in that class and give you an opportunity and not play games with it. Uh, my frustration comes from um, the funding that would be crafted if academic acceleration passed so that we can, we can lock in the supports to, to give every child a fighting chance. And so my hope to the legislature to our legislators, I want to be perfectly clear if you ever watch this, please support the academic acceleration bill. Make this bill not optional statewide and then put the funding behind it so that kids that are in academically accelerated classes have a fighting chance to be all they can be for the rest of their lives. And now I will climb down off my soapbox. This time we'll move forward in our meeting and we'll hear from Chuck Christensen and Cindy Black on our TPIP. Thank you, President Moore, members of the board. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to have an opportunity to chat with you a little bit about some exciting and important work that's been happening in relationship to the uh, legislatively mandated changes in teacher and principal evaluation. We had an opportunity a couple months ago in a work study to share some preliminary information with you in regards to what the uh, legislative requirements were. Uh, we've done some fairly significant work uh, since that time. Uh, that's uh, joint work that we've been doing with the uh, Teachers and Principals Association and uh, is a, uh, a function also of uh, collective bargaining. So we want to uh, share with you uh, an update and uh, seek possible approval for the uh, adoption of evaluation systems to be used for both, uh, well, one for teachers and one for principals. So to share the specifics of our uh, work and uh, what the committees are uh, recommending, I would like to introduce uh, Cindy Black, our Director of uh, Leadership Development. Thank you. All right, so we're going to share some information with you about where we're at in this process. And as you know, it began with legislation starting about in March of 2010, and then last year some additional legislation kind of changed a little bit what we had on the docket, uh, but we've been responsive to that. As a result of the legislation, the state got together and created some pilot districts so that they could go ahead and get started on the work before the implementation was required. So these districts are the ones that went ahead and got started right away. And we're glad for that because their work has been able to kind of set us up through everything that they've learned. So the teacher uh, evaluation system is comprised of these eight state criteria which were developed. Um, we've gone from seven to eight with the teacher. And if you'll take a look at the bolded criteria, the bolded ones are three criteria where there are student data uh, required as a part of the documentation for meeting those criteria. Likewise, with the principal evaluation, there's also eight criteria for the principals, and three of those as well require student data pieces. So we're changing over from a system that's satisfactory or unsatisfactory and moving to one where there's levels, which really will help us be able to, to grow as learners. And so the scale has unsatisfactory, basic, proficient, and distinguished as ways to um, evaluate. And there are rubrics and uh, descriptors for each of those areas, which will also help us be able to provide uh, great feedback for our teachers as they grow principles as well. So a little bit about our processes. We have met, um, created a couple of teams. 
We have a team working on the teacher evaluation system. There's 14 members of those. Uh, there's seven FWA, seven administrative. Uh, for the principal evaluation, we have a team of seven. Uh, you can see the uh, distribution there with people. But I think the most important thing to say about our teamwork is that it's been a very collaborative process. So everything that we have done uh, since we started this work has been done through processes that have involved all the parties, and it's been actually very productive and uh, important work that I think all of our groups feel really good about. So we had to get uh, roll up our sleeves and get some work done. And the first thing that we had to do is take a look at what instructional framework would best fit our district. So the state had identified three different frameworks that we could look at. And those frameworks would really define the instructional program here in Federal Way. And so our team took a look at all of those through some extensive, lengthy, actually two days process to uh, really be able to make a thoughtful decision and decided that the University of Washington Center for Educational Leadership framework best fit um, our work here in Federal Way, especially in relation to the standards-based work that we've been doing. The state also, sorry about my voice, <clears throat> identified two leadership frameworks uh, that districts could choose from. And so there was a Marzano model for that, and then also AWSP, the Principals Association, worked directly with the eight criteria and created a model for that leadership framework, and that's the framework that is recommended by that team. So there's some legal requirements to our implementation, um, and that is that we have to start next year, and uh, due to our Race to the Top grant, we're gonna be fully implemented by 2014-2015 year. Um, and we have the same implementation cycle for both the teacher evaluation and the principal evaluation. As a part of the evaluation process, there's really two pieces of the puzzle that go together. There's the comprehensive evaluation, where a teacher and principal would be evaluated on all eight criteria in the year. And then there's the focus evaluation, which is more of what they used to call the short form or goal setting, which is on one of the eight criteria. And it rolls through a four-year cycle, so comprehensive one year, and as long as you're in good standing, focus, 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 and then comprehension or comprehensive again the next year. So we needed to figure out how are we going to do this? We have a lot of teachers. Uh, we have principals who are learning the evaluation system. We have a lot of principals. We have um, our evaluators of the principals learning the new system. And so legally, we're required uh, to put our provisional teachers and principals and our plans of improvement or probationary teachers, our principals, on the comprehensive the very first year. Um, also, principals who are new to their position here in Federal Way need to go on the comprehensive. Um, and if they are moving like from assistant principal to principal, we also want them to be on the comprehensive. So all the other teachers and principals will uh, start up the following year. So hopefully this is uh, clear enough for you to take a look at. This is our plan right now that we're proposing for phasing in for teachers. And it basically starts, like I said, all of our provisional and probational on the comprehensive in 2013. We have provisional teachers this year who will be continuing teachers next year. We don't want them to go into our current system knowing that the following year they'll be in the new system. So we're gonna take those year teachers and put them right straight into the focus evaluation. And then we're creating cohorts to start in the next uh, couple of years to phase those in on that four year rotation cycle. And those will be some site-based decisions that schools can do in order to be able to figure out which cohort um, I would go into. <clears throat> with the knowledge that as a principal, you, you have the ability to be able to suggest that or require that teachers who are struggling or that you have concerns about can float into that comprehensive one. Um, we also want every administrator who may not have provisional teachers to have at least two people that they are going to be evaluating on the comprehensive evaluation. So that includes our assistant principals at the secondary. So we want everybody to get their feet wet with the full comprehensive evaluation before we're rolling more people into it the next years. So the following uh, years on the grid here just kind of shows how we'll quarter it out and get those uh, rotating through comprehensive and focus evaluation. So at this time, we have identified the instructional framework. 
which will help us to know what is instructional that we're looking at, uh, and it ties very nicely with our standards-based work in Common Core. We've identified a leadership framework that really does outline and um, define for us what effective leadership is in the era in which we're leading right now. And we have a process for transitioning our staff. Here's some things we need to do next. We need to figure out what are the measures of evidence for the eight criteria that aren't directly observable. Some of those things you can walk in the classroom and take note of and see happening, and others are around the planning and the knowledge and all those things. Um, the assessment pieces of how do I progress monitor uh, our kids. So we have to figure out what does that evidence look like. We need to figure out what the student data pieces are that principals would be using or in collaboration with their teachers to uh, take a look at how students are actually progressing as a result of our instruction. We still need to work out processes, forms, procedures, and all of those details. And we have some placeholders for professional development, but we need to figure out exactly what that PD um, is going to look like. And then we just need to have our ongoing communication. And we've currently had one joint principal and FWA rep meeting, and that went really well, where we could share some facts about here's what we know and here's what we don't know, because everybody wants to know everything right now. And of course, we don't have all of that information for everybody yet. So just trying to allay the fears and to help people understand that we're in a good place and it's going to be OK. And that's the end of that part. Right before we uh, entertain some questions, a couple of uh, other clarifying uh, comments that I would make. As I said at the outset, that evaluation uh, is a, uh, a function of a working condition, which then becomes a function of bargaining. So the teams that we put together were collaborative teams that both represent uh, union and management uh, perspectives. But at the end of the day, uh, the two uh, recommendations that are being brought forth uh, require um, board approval because it's uh, an outcome of the not only collaborative work but a, a bargaining process. So a recommendation is coming forward uh, out of bargaining uh, potentially for the board to consider the adoption of the, uh, excuse me, um, Leadership frameworks uh, and the self ID uh, for the uh, uh, for the teachers. So at this time, I think we would um, ask for uh, any questions that you might have regarding the work and the uh, next steps. Thanks. Uh, question is there does it does it seem that there could be a conflict having uh, seven teachers and seven principals on your evaluation team of teachers does it seem like there could be a conflict there when it comes to grading teachers I'm not sure why there would be the it wasn't all just principals there were uh, district level uh, administrators and some principals um, in the process so there were a total of seven in that group right there's seven in the principal evaluation team which is d three district administrators and four principals just trying to work out the details of the process that we'd be following the framework that we would be using the implementation kind of like all the what's and then the evaluators of principals will get some training in order to be able to implement the actual evaluation but but in the process you'll have seven and seven is that not correct you have seven teachers okay so there's two different models so so one yeah so on one team we have seven teachers and then we have seven administrators some of who are principals some of whom are district level uh, administrators so it's in, it was important to have a variety of perspectives because principals are the people who are going to be responsible for um, doing the actual observations and carrying out the evaluation of teachers within the framework that's been um, identified. And uh, obviously teachers have an interest on 
what criteria and processes are you going to use to you know evaluate my performance so it was helpful to hear from the parties that are directly involved in either being evaluated or responsible for carrying out the evaluation uh, to make a good informed decision about what model uh, makes the most sense, what processes uh, for implementation seem fair uh, and reasonable. And on the uh, principal team, then we had um, a couple of considerations. So principals themselves are going to be evaluated by district mm -hmm. level supervisors, assistant superintendents who are responsible for supervising principal. But on the same tool, the principal has a responsibility for evaluating an assistant principal if they're at middle school or high school. So they had kind of a dual interest. How does this relate to me as a person that's going to be evaluated? And then what are my interests around uh, evaluating uh, my subordinates, assistant principals? So at the end of every board meeting, we get one of these. This is a board evaluation. And, and I get to fill one out too. And I seem to always give myself a five. And so I guess my point would be, I'm just, if, if I'm going to get better, then I have to take the twos I get from other board members and, and find out what that is. And I can skew that if, I, if, if, if I'm relying too heavily on judging myself. And that would be my concern in the process here, just making sure that we have a balanced approach that is not going to be overly sympathetic on a side where we, we really, in all honesty, need improvement. It also might be helpful at some point to share the framework <clears throat> because um, it looks very different than, I think, what we might consider a regular evaluative right. tool. Mm -hmm. And um, just because it is something that's so very different that um, I, that would be something that I think, um, because there's many of the frameworks that are out there and districts had to choose, um, but very clearly, like standards-based grading and like learning targets, there's very clear indicators and there's a lot of self-reflection as well in my own professional work about what I need to do to change my work with kids as opposed to, I mean, there's, there's some of that too. We have to be really careful about um, also when you look at evaluation what is effective evaluation and how is it that I also am part of developing my own plan for myself and knowing what I need to do so it may be helpful to share the tool well, and, that, and I think that's the piece that's missing because I, I attended a workshop around this back in I think it was last summer or fall and since then I because um, in that workshop it was mentioned these you know these samples of these tools were introduced and it was recommended that school districts would be looking at these tools and that school boards would have to approve them and that um, but school board members should have the opportunity to take the time to look at the evaluation tools and get a better understanding um, on what we are approving and I've been asking since that time for a presentation and um, to get a presentation today where that is very um, just very minute and we're expected to make a decision I I'm not ready to make any type of decision without having a, a deeper conversation as to well, which one is the best evaluation right. tool so, yeah so for I, I appreciate that I had thought that we had shared the evaluation tools at the work study so there were three there were three tools the Marzano the Danielson and the uh, cell 5d so we haven't none of those models or tools have changed since we had the opportunity to talk about them in the work study the criteria the eight criteria have been established by the state so that's not anything that we've changed mm -hmm. the four level system was also established by the <coughs> state so I would be happy again to share those materials and have you have an opportunity to to dig in the, to them a little bit more and I apologize not the tools in not all of the tools in general, but why did you make the decision about the tools that you made the decision about? Because they're, they're, in, they're really in-depth tools. And so the two that you made a decision about, really I, what I've heard from other school districts, I haven't heard that other school districts have accepted those tools or approved those tools. And so I just would like to know further why what we chose 
and those tools is important for evaluating our teachers and our principals. Principals. So coming down to the actual tools, a, a more of a discussion around those tools. So can I just, and I, I guess I would just like to ask a remembrance. So Chuck, when we had the work study, was that prior to actually the decision being landed on which tool to make? So what you presented was the option of the three tools in the state that you as a team were kind of reflecting on and trying to make some decisions on. And what I'm gathering from tonight is that you've landed. And you've landed on Marzano. So. The cell 5D. Oh, the 5D. Sorry. Yeah. What did, was there? Where? I don't even know where my brain went. Yeah. So you landed on 5D, but maybe that's the piece now is, is that we had this kind of idea of we've got these things we need to make some choices about. And it says clearly you've made a choice, but I'm hearing Angela say, so talk a little bit more about how come you decided what you decided and what made, I mean, what, what, what does that mean for, um, what does that mean for us and why that versus something else? I think. Let me just share a little bit about yeah. that process. Yeah. Um, maybe it won't be in depth enough, but just surface level for right now. Um, we spent two days looking at all three of those instructional frameworks. Those are our only choices. Those are outlined by the state legislature that you have to choose from one of these three. And so uh, we went through a narrowing process. Um, we narrowed out Marzano first because of its total complexity and disconnection to the work that we we're doing in the district. So that got set aside. Then we're really looking at the Charlotte Danielson model and the cell model um, just to try to take a look at where is the fit here. And so we began that by taking a look at what is the language in BASIC. So BASIC is an unsatisfactory, it's a step above that. And, and what kind of language is found in there? And is that a, a floor level that we could live with that these qualities and characteristics that we're saying are BASIC that are meeting, are they strong enough for us? Then we took a look at distinguished language. And what does it really mean to be distinguished? And um, I can give you the one example that we found between Charlotte Danielson and this one is, in the Charlotte Danielson model in Proficient, uh, it was describing, or you had a cognitively busy classroom. And in the cell, or in the, in the distinguished section, it was a cognitively vibrant classroom. So that language was a little bit tricky. So like, how do I decide if that's busy or is that vibrant? Are you proficient or are you distinguished? We wanted more specific language than that. So the next thing that we took a look at is how does it, what is the language that you use as you go from unsatisfactory to basic to proficient to distinguished? What does that look like? Does it build? Um, can you tell what that is? Do I have to infer between busy and distinguished? Or are there actual specific things laid out that I would be able to see? And the cell had just way better language around that, including standards and, and assessments and all the work that we're doing here. Um, and additionally, <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice tonight. Um, the difference between proficient and distinguished in the cell one moves it from the teacher centered classroom to the student centered classroom. It was powerful for our team. So I could live, I could be proficient, but I'm not ever gonna be distinguished if I don't add that student piece where students have discourse with each other, where students are in control of some of their learning, where students have choices over what they do. That was very powerful for us. Charlotte Danielson did not have that. So through this winnowing process, the cell 5D turned out to be the strongest for us based on those things and also the closest match just in terms of the work that we're doing and the vision that we have for what we want our kids to be empowered to do in our classrooms. That was really two days worth of work, deep reading, highlighting, chart, charting and all of that sort of thing to really get deep into those frameworks so that we could make a really uh, strong and um, a decision that really reflected the work that we're doing here in Federal Way. Satisfied. May I? Yes. So our next board meeting is April 9th. I'm hearing that the board's not ready to, to make action on this recommendation tonight. Is that a, a safe assumption? I believe so. When, when this is a legal requirement that we have intentionally um, not moved quickly on. In to, uh, as far as making a, a, a recommendation to the board. But it gave us time to see what others were doing. 
and, and, and for you to work with your, your teams to research the tools and come forward with the recommendation. So having said that, when does the when do you need to have the board's action? Because we have to pick one of the three. Well, the bottom line is we have to implement starting next September. I understand. So when when do you need the recommendation to to come from the board so that you can begin implementation? Yeah, well, hopefully we could get that at the next meeting because okay. We have other planning steps right. that need to occur. And, so, and so here's what I'd like you to do. We'll need to provide staff so, uh, in order to be able to move the process. Tony, forward. if Super, you're, Superintendent, you're, we can we can uh, we can call for a motion and yeah. put it to a vote and see see how it comes out. We okay. don't have to be unanimous on this particular <clears throat> okay uh, frame of action. Um, being unanimous is uh, is okay, <laughs> but not necessary. So. Um, again, I, and I and I'm really not trying to beat a dead horse. Sure. The whole thing comes down to the people that that carry out the plan. It, it, Absolutely, it doesn't matter what you do. And so I would not even begin to impugn the integrity of the seven teachers that you have chosen. I just want it to be on the record that, of course, we we're trying to get better, and we want to press. I know that we have. Um, we have seen the teachers in need of improvement. Uh, we have, we've worked on those particular issues. And it is my sincere hope that we will begin uh, the process of helping teachers get better, those that desire to get better. We, we will start this process not to get rid of teachers, but to identify weaknesses that we can then help them on. And, and not having a clear, um, not having a, a clear assessment by this group that you've put together um, is would do a disservice not only to them but to the students as well and so I just I want to say I do believe it depends on who you have on the team and and that you know we, of course we'll want to know what happens if, as a result of it too so director Wilson did you have I would like to put a motion on the floor if I might um, to move that the Center for Educational Leadership five dimensions CEL 5d be approved as the evaluation tool for teachers starting the in the 2013 2014 school year consistent with the implementation schedule as presented as well I'd like to move that the Association of Washington School Principals AWSP leadership framework be approved as the evaluation tool for principals and assistant principals beginning with the 2013 2014 school year and I appreciate your um, explanation and I'll second that it's been moved and seconded for the discussion um, I, I'm going to recommend that school board members actually take the time to look at the evaluation tools and, and make sure they're making a informed decision before they make this vote. And, um, you know, it's great that the work has been done. It's great that union members and teachers and principals and um, key administrators have the opportunity to review it and make a decision. Um, but this is being reflective on a lot more teachers and principals um, beyond that group and I just want to make sure that we are looking at it and making a, a, a very wise informed decision is it dis are we at a discussion yes we're having an open discussion um, and my discussion would be that I feel like I am at a place where I am quite familiar with all three so I'm comfortable putting it out there and would like to support um, the 5d um, framework yeah and I would I would agree with uh, Director Wilson, having looked at the, the wording in particular, the way it breaks it down and allows that teacher, student, the whole thing being able to come cohesively, I, I agree that it's the, for me, it was the better. So and I'd also like to add that you're not just voting on the 5D, you're voting no, on, there's on, two, on there's two different ones that you're voting on. Mm -hmm. So, well, no, I'm not talking about all three. You're, you're, two. We are voting tonight on a teacher evaluation and, and a principal. principal evaluation. They're two different tools mm -hmm. that are being used for those mm -hmm. two evaluations. Correct. And yes. and out of the three, the 5D, the Danielson, and the Marzano, um, the decision in of the administrators in this district is that they would like to look at the 5D. And Correct. there's also one for principals, and that's Co a different Correct. tool. Associated. What's the name of the other the tool for AW, the AWS, AWS, AWS. AWS. Yes. Marzano had a tool and then yes. the Washington yes. Principals Association created a, a tool, tool as well. There's two, there's mm -hmm. two different tools where 
voting on tonight. So, Director Griffin, is there is there something that causes you alarm on on those um, evaluations? I just, I just think, as a school board, before you, we, before the five of us make a decision on this, that the five of us need to know what you're making a decision on. I mean, we talk about teachers getting better and principals um, being held accountable, and, and this is a big decision that's being made. And I, I just think it shouldn't just be taken lightly but by a simple presentation I just that's all that's all I'm expecting but it, you know, I mean each one of you are accountable for yourselves so and go. I guess I just I don't want anyone to believe that a five-minute PowerPoint presentation is what I would consider to be um, giving me the knowledge I need to make the, the choice of the decision that I make it that I've had exposure and I've had some work with both of those tools not only on the principal side but on the teacher side with all three of those and in my own world I am evaluated myself on 5D so um, I'm familiar with that particular um, framework but also have been introduced to the other two so I I feel like as an individual I would be able tonight to make an informed decision Wonderful. for the discussions I, I would say for me uh, starting back last August when I caught, caught wind of this starting to come through the pipeline I it got me excited um, Obviously, you've, there's been work put in across the state, and this whole idea of accountability is 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 critical. And I know we have some parts of it, you know, every school district does, but uh, to have something focused like this, not just for teachers but also for principals, um, I think this is a great obviously a great step in the right direction. My hope for this is obviously we have some tools right now, is that. Um, and and I see tonight us making a decision now. It's it's also following up and seeing if we do do these assessments it's great that we get results back but but now what um, we want to see changes obviously in those principals and teachers uh, we want to see them get great feedback that'll help them out maybe some blind spots that they have uh, if there's implementation of different uh, things that we can come alongside of them and help them fantastic and at the same time too you know also to um, have some real documents right down there to on evaluation and not just kind of hearsay and how I feel about you and that's really what we've done for our students in this district you know with the power standards as you touched on um, you know we're looking at just criteria and not just how I feel about somebody but are you really hitting the benchmark in these particular areas so for me I'm, I'm excited about this and um, and I think uh, I would just challenge as we go to implement this if if we do pass this vote tonight uh, that we really do it with uh, not uh, light but really with uh, going after it and wanting to get those results bringing the truth to light and then when we get the truth there to really come alongside our teachers our principals and really make Federal Way Public Schools the best school district it can be so thank you further discussion hearing none will vote all in favor aye aye opposed Nay. the ayes have it motion carries Four to one. Thank you. This time we'll hear from our assistant superintendent, Sally McLean, on budget planning. Good evening, President Moore, members of the board, Superintendent New, staff in our audience. Tonight, um, I am here to talk about some of the local trends that we're seeing as we develop our 2013-14 um, budget. You'll recall in um, prior presentations, we touched uh, briefly on the impacts of federal sequestration. We followed that up last time by talking about the uh, various uh, state budget processes that um, the state was going through as they worked with um, this budget. I thought it was a good time tonight to talk about enrollment as a reminder uh, for all of us that most of our funding formulas um, are driven from enrollment and they fluctuate up and down based on what's happening within the context of enrollment. I mean, assuming state funding is held constant and federal funding is held constant. Um, one of the things I lamented about a decade ago was the fact that our funding formulas treat all of our costs as though they are variable. 
So for example, if you have 10 fewer students in a building, you're going to get $50,000 less funding for that particular school building, but you're not necessarily going to have $50,000 in less cost. You may not be able to have one fewer teacher. You probably aren't going to have fewer custodians because you still have the same number of bathrooms to clean. You're still setting up for lunch in the same square footage. You're not going to have less of a principal or less of a clerical staff or less of any of those kinds of, of staff that are in buildings that sometimes I refer to as, as fixed cost. Teachers and students do ebb and flow. I mean, if you want to think about them in accounting terms, they are more variable. But all of our funding formulas treat all of our costs as though they're variable. And unfortunately, that's not really the way we can respond to fluctuations in enrollment. Before I dive into the enrollment history lesson, I think it's important to remember um, or learn a little bit about terms and definitions. So oftentimes you'll hear our students referred to in terms of headcount. So headcount is reflective of each student, regardless of the time they spend in the district. Maybe they don't spend any time in the district if they're a full-time Running Start student, but they would still count in our headcount. Typically headcount numbers are based on an October 1 measurement. Full-time equivalents are actually reflected of the funded portion of time. So another easy way to think about this is with um, a half-time kindergarten student. They count as one full head count, but they only count as half an FTE because they're only with us for half of the day. Then head count and full time get compounded. Um, when you talk about average annual head count, Average annual headcount is the average of the number of students who were serving on the first of every month. Um, it used to be from September to May. During last legislative session, they extended that to June. So your average annual headcount has been artificially depressed by expanding that average over 10 months rather than nine months at least in a district that has stable or slightly declining enrollment. If you were in a growing district, your average annual headcount would have grown by adding that 10th month. So then you have the same concept about average annual FTE or average annual full-time equivalents. Again, that measurement is a function of the amount of time students spent with us on those measurement days, which are typically the first day of every month, again, now September to June. Um, to give you some example of uh, an example of how changing that average annual full-time equivalency impacted us, last year was the first year June was measured. We lost 30 full-time equivalents between May and June by adding that June count date, mm. or $150,000. So you can't really staff up and staff a program for October 1, which is typically your highest level of student enrollment, that's going to continue to decline through June. You can't staff for June because you're going to be way too crowded in October, but it's not like as these students decline, I can say, oh, thank you very much. Um, we don't need you now for second semester. It doesn't work that way. Then to further complicate these comparisons, um, there's actuals because that's what actually happens, and you measure that every month during the year and after the fact, but then we also have budgeted headcount and we have budgeted FTE. So typically when I'm talking to you, I'm talking about budgeted headcount and budgeted full-time equivalents because we're always talking about what's our plan look like for the following year. Any questions about those terms or definitions? Okay. I'm going to show you some pictures. In, um, and this may be a slide that some of you are familiar with. Um, I was lucky enough when I started work here to inherit some data that people had compiled since 1956-57 that was reflective of the October 1 headcount of the district. And it's a pretty amazing graph to look at. You can certainly see the baby boom and the echo of the baby boom. Um, and we have continued to keep this updated through time. What I find more interesting to look at 
are the variations from year to year because we build an annual budget and so we try to plan for those variations from year to year. So when you look at that slide, you see a little bit of a different story. You can still see the baby boom and the echo of the baby boom, but there were some dramatic changes in the total enrollment and in the growth of that enrollment or the decline of that enrollment from period to period. If you look at the space um, from like 1971, 72 to 85, 86, where you first start to see some lines go below zero. That was when we started to lose some enrollment. That was during the Boeing recession or the times of the very high, uh, well, at least at the time, seemed like very high fuel costs. Um, that was also the time for us as a school district where um, basic education hadn't yet been defined by the state. Our taxpayers were paying $41.98 per $1,000 of assessed valuation, mm -hmm. and we suffered um, three double levy failures in a row. So there were six years where we had no local support to uh, sustain our schools, and during that period of time we did actually uh, close um, for elementary schools during that time period. Now you'll start to see on the echo of the baby boom, you can see, first you can see the dot-com bubble burst and now you can see the Great Recession impacts. Again, you can see some comparable trends. Unlike in the 70s, however, during the Great Recession, we have um, not moved forward to close schools because we have had we have continued to enjoy uh, the voter support of our educational programs and operations levies. But we are still looking at a period of slowly um, declining enrollment. Now again, these first two slides are head count. The next slide I'm moving to is average annual full-time equivalents uh, without running start. <laughs> and again, this uh, typically running start funding is considered a pass-through. Um, we claim the FTE, but we pass that through for all intents and purposes to the community colleges. So when I look at some of this data, I like to look at it without the running start factors in it so I can figure out what's happening in our actual school buildings. And you can see our average annual FTE goes up and down, up and down and up and down. And the black line that runs across that is just a linear regression that continues to show um, the fact that from 99-2000 to um, through February 2012-13, we're continuing to see a declining enrollment. This looks fairly dramatic, but over this 13-year uh, period, that's uh, reflective of about 265 full-time equivalents. When we have looked at this from the 2000 census tract to the 2010 census tract, and you look at school-age children, we've seen in our census tracts an overall decline of the number of students who are living in our community between the ages of 5 and 18. So our loss in enrollment is, is commensurate with the overall change in the population um, in our census tracts. I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, one of the things that gets um, um, that adds to the FTE comp complication, as I was mentioning earlier, is the the state can actually change the way you count full time equivalencies. So you'll see a bump up in 2009-10. And that bump up was a reflection of when the, while the state has been funding um, all day kindergarten in some of our schools for a period of time, they weren't being counted as full time equivalencies in the, um, on the P223. So in 2009-10, they changed that. So that caused a bump up in our enrollment. In 2011-12, as I mentioned, that uh, we've lost, they added, um, a tenth month to the average annual compu computation. And for 2012-13, this is, of course, um, a preliminary number because that is reflective through February. And the actual numbers, sorry, the way this got printed and re reproduced for you, if you want to see all the data from um, this particular slide, it's on the back side of the graph. Would have been nicer if it had been laid out. Um, so one of the questions you always ask is like, well, okay, so we looked at our own census tract data and we felt like the decline that we were seeing in our enrollment was reflective of our overall population in the community, but how does our average annual FTE compare with our neighboring districts? 
and um, you can see for all of our neighboring districts that districts have generally been fairly stable or also slightly declining um, in that same time frame. 2012-13 in this particular slide when this data was pulled was through January so it was at the end of first semester. I would predict that by the time each of these school districts gets through with June reporting that you'll continue to see um, the same sort of slight, slight decline or fairly uh, stable enrollment except for Highline School District which did actually has actually grown in the last five years um, fairly substantially. And since I mentioned Running Start, it's always nice to see what's happening with Running Start, even though I was factoring them out of what's happening in our buildings. What you see in this particular slide is a percent of our Running Start students as a percentage of um, our juniors and seniors, uh, because it's juniors and seniors who can attend Running Start. And this graph um, also tells a story, a couple of things to remember in uh, 2000. 405 um, Highline Community College opened a branch campus here in Federal Way called Puget Sound Early College. So you can see that rapid growth was while Puget Sound Early College was open here in the community. So it made the Running Start program more accessible to students. They didn't have to be able to drive to Highline Community College themselves. They didn't necessarily have to get multiple buses to get to Highline Community College. Highline Community College uh, shuttered that program in 0809 and you can see that deep that deep drop um, as a result of that. And then you can kind of see the impacts maybe of the recession. But if you look at 2011-12 uh, compared to 2005-06, um, our Running Start population as a percent of our juniors and seniors was approximately the same. Okay. So it stayed fairly stable during that time period. What happened in 11-12 though? Another one of those legislative pieces, that legislative actions that was implemented for the first time last year had to deal with the amount of time a student could be enrolled in school. Prior to 11-12, a student could actually be enrolled full time in a high school and full time in Running Start. They could count as a total of two FTE in your average annual FTE. That robust funding was reduced and student enrollment was capped at 1.2. And I think certainly as you look at 2012-13 that what you're seeing now is uh, more of our students taking advantage of that Running Start opportunity and claiming their FTE through Running Start than what you see staying in high school. That's what I believe. So we see some overall changes in our enrollment and I think as terms of looking at next year's budget, remember we have a budgeted FTE for this year and we'll have a budgeted FTE for next year. One of the things that's going to impact our budget development next year is the fact that um, we will be budgeting 300 fewer average annual FTEs in next year's budget. So as we start to talk more about um, various budget initiatives and implications, you'll see that um, as we get deeper into uh, some of those discussions. Certainly as we move forward with the budget planning process, there are other uh, considerations for us to um, also talk about. We've had a long-standing um, philosophy here of um, budgeting um, use of fund balance. Um, again, I would anticipate part of our solution for this year will be budgeting below the policy that requires 3% because our actuals always come in higher than 3%. We know that with federal sequestration, we will have some discussions about program impacts. Historically in our district, um, categorical programs or federally funded programs have lived within their resources or within their allocation unless we've made a conscious choice to subsidize that program. We may have some of those choices to make um, in the coming years depending on uh, the changes in federal sequestration. 
And of course, I think we have um, not a single budget year discussion, but as we look at some of the potential state funding changes that could be funded if McCleary is fully funded, uh, we, we, we have this dilemma between seeing declining enrollment changes, which would mean you have some unused capacity in your buildings, um, kind of juxtaposed against the McCleary um, lawsuit and the funding formulas that would drive more state funded all day K into a building, which creates some capacity issues that could potentially reduce class size in grades one through three. That means you need more classrooms if you're going to be serving 17 students in a classroom instead of 25 to 30, you need more classrooms. <laughs> Same with state funded all day K. If you're no longer going to have AM, PM, you're not going to be serving 40 to 50 kids in one classroom. You're going to be serving 20, 25 in one classroom. You've doubled the number of classrooms that you need. So um, while the funding formulas are all variable, we have some fixed costs that we have to continue to be able to support. And even if we manage to balance state funding with our enrollment changes, as we wait to see what this legislative session does and the next two following that, we're undoubtedly finally going to come to a point where we're going to have to look at making some boundary adjustments because of the way our student population is currently enrolled in the district in order to be able to, to spread that capacity burden across the district and be able to support those all day K um, classrooms and those smaller primary classrooms even when that funding becomes available. And you just thought I was going to talk about budget. <laughs> so timelines, you kind of know, oh, I forgot to go back and change that. The legislature didn't actually convene on January 20, on January 9th. Um, sorry, we know the state revenue forecast is due out on March 20th. We would expect the, the, of, uh, the full Senate budget to come out sometime after March 20th, the full House budget to come out immediately after that, with the legislature adjourning, if it's on time, on April 28th. Uh, the superintendent's budget recommendation is currently slated to be rolled out on May 28th, with your first public hearing and second public hearing um, following at the two meetings in June. So that's just a bit of what we're seeing with enrollment. Um, lots more data, but um, I felt like those were the relevant pieces to share this evening. Are there any questions I can answer this evening? Budget questions, board members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Board, we have a resolution on the that you all should have in your packet. And, and I know, President Moore, that uh, <clears throat> this came from WASDA. <laughs> so in spite of your <laughs> earlier comments, <laughs> um, <laughs> this uh, resolution is to, as we have over the last several years, constantly hammered the legislature to fully fund uh, education. This is one area that WASTA does agree in, that we should fully fund uh, education. And I believe there has been uh, over 150 districts that have already signed into this resolution, basically asking the legislature to follow the McCleary decision and fully fund basic education as defined by them. I could read the entire resolution if you would like, or we can just go ahead and... Uh, make a, a motion that we uh, approve this resolution. Which Would I'm, you care to make the motion? I will make the motion that we approve resolution 2013-08, a resolution urging the state, Washington State Legislature to address K-12 funding. I'll second. For the discussion. But Director Barney, do you believe that this resolution has passed unanimously in every district so far? Uh, from what I have heard, yes, it has. Unanimously. Yes, from what I understand from those districts that uh, that I talked to, I haven't talked to all, but those that I did talk to, they was passed unanimously by those uh, those boards that I did talk to. Um, will it have any more influence than what we have already been hammering on the state legislature for the last well 11 years that I've been on the board? No. I don't know. All right. Any more further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. <laughs> All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. <laughs> Not unanimous. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I'm, and I'm doing that in protest because I think academic acceleration is basic education. And with that, <laughs> board, you can assess tonight's meeting. And that'll be a two for the president. <laughs> I will skew the numbers dramatically <laughs> with my vote. Ms. Poppins, do we have any action items uh, open this evening? No, sir, you do not. Uh, thank you very much. Superintendent New. I don't dare have any more comments. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.